What's up, guys? Welcome back to Fireside with Fathers. Um, before we get going here on our second part of the Rise of the Rad Trads, which we will explain a bit the title and what that's all about, we're going to start with a Hail Mary, giving everything up into the hands of our Blessed Mother, asking her for uh, a peaceful and uh, a uniting um, Fireside. And may she be present from the beginning to the end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for Holy us Mary, sinners, Mary. now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, yeah, the Rad Treads is just to provoke, and I think everybody knows that. Um, it's nothing like we're not taking this posture where we're getting solid down and going after anybody. It really is. The point is is to open up a bit and um, try to get some uh, clarification, um, some basic you know, knowledge maybe in some places where we don't have any. And throughout the whole thing, like, look, guys, the tone is not going to be one of like here we are we're coming after you to attack you so i'm just getting that off there in the first place it's something that i haven't been very interested in to tell you the truth i've been in the religious life for 12 years that's when i had my conversion um and what i've come to know with my conversion uh is a faith that is vibrant joyful um exciting adventurous and i would say in a nutshell catholic so that's what i've basically known for the past 12 years since my conversion and uh, the whole, like, are you traditionalist? Are you charismatic? Are you this? Are you that? It's never really been an issue, to tell you the truth. And I've never really even thought of it, even though I did go to university where it was pretty divided. And uh, today we have Father Joseph Bloomer. He was with me in the same university, Ave Maria. And it was pretty evident that there was the trad group and there was the charismatic group. And then the home of the mother group, which is the order I'm in now, was basically right down the middle. And I think there's something very healthy about that. There's no, I don't know, there wasn't like an extreme or there wasn't this posture. So Rad Trad, um, I think we're all traditional. I think we have to be as far as Catholics concerned. You know, we've got tradition, uh, magisterium, sacred scripture. It's like the package deal. Like we we have that. So we're, we're Rad Trads as well, if you like. But like what we're going to really want to be going for here is the... Um, Maybe the Glad Trad, as Scott Hahn coined. I think he's a great one if you guys haven't seen him. His his whole view on this is very good. He's he's pointed out that a lot of his traditionalist friends end up uh, being mad trads, um, you know, because they're just so focused on fighting the battle every single day and they're, everything seems to be consumed on what's going wrong that they kind of forget the whole picture and things get very reduced and you can see it on their scowl you know they become mad trads so lads this is the whole point of it we're hoping to open up a bit and um, we will be answering some questions from last week because we kind of left some open-ended things um first time we have two guests and i'm um, very proud of both the guests because they're both brothers one is brother in uh religion brother father joseph bloomer he's coming from rio chico ecuador third world country connection so we're gonna hope that that's gonna be smooth and okay i think it will and then my blood brother uh james um never thought i would see the day that you know we would be discussing you know church things together uh we have a you know our relationship has grown since my conversion thanks be to god and it is an honor privilege very proud of of james because he's uh He's a university professor. Um, he's scholarly. I've told him that he might have to tone down the language just a bit, you know, just so we can have a vocabulary that everybody understands and uh, keep things humble. And uh, no, it's going to be, I think it's going to be great. And like what we were hoping is that it's just going to be a discussion here, opening up some topics when the questions come in, hopefully answering them. I'm going to throw um, one right at, we're going to start with you, James. Just going to throw it at you first. Um, so you you married into kind of like, you know, a traditional, more traditionalist uh, family. I remember there was a point there where you were, you know, you're big. You were you probably still are. I don't know, like into the, the traditional extraordinary mass. But um, what would you say maybe to people now or like what would your take be on, um, you know, the people who kind of see Novus Ordo? Um, 
you know, that's the, the, the new world order mass or the new order mass. That's, you know, maybe it's valid at the end of the day, but like licit, no, you know, and like the people who would make that distinction between, you know, novus ordo can't happen, it's done. And there's basically just the extraordinary form. Maybe you can just kind of flesh out there and even from experience or from whatever. Start off with that. Yeah, uh, my so I, I um, my met my I, wife um, in college. My wife she was, college. Uh, she was a member of the society, a member of Pius the tenth, um, Pius the tenth. Um, and when she came um, to college, she came to college. She had just she finished had her senior just project, senior project, which was, which was um, um, in high school. She in high school she researched and, and paper on why the novus ordo mass, ordo mass was an expression, was an expression of, the of modernism, it. which had been which had been sort of condemned by previous popes, and why the Vatican II was suspect. So when we met, I came from as as you know, Father Luke. A very charismatic background. Um, we spent a lot of time in three-hour-long healing masses and people resting the spirit and a lot of speaking in tongues and uh, um, maybe a kumbaya, maybe a here, kumbaya and here and there. Um, um, and so we were, and we were, so we were very, different, different, very different uh, uh, ends, uh, of the spectrum, ends of the spectrum. And, and over the course, over of, four course years, of four years, we sort of drew each other, drew each other into the um, middle. Um, but my wife's experience, some of the language she was using in college, I, I remember these sentences like, the Noah's Order Mass is valid, but it's it's not pleasing in the eyes of God. It offends God every time it's celebrated. So, so Christ maybe becomes present, but he um, he doesn't want to become present in Mass. It's the same as a Black Mass, a Satanist Mass, in which, you know, purportedly the Satanists can make God present, um, only to um, to defile the host. So that was the sort of approach she had, and it was. Um, the suspicion, really, that undergirded uh, her entire faith. Her faith was oriented. I mean, Father Luke, you talked about the posture. Her entire posture toward the church was one of suspicion. It was the posture she had towards the modern world, um, that the church was corrupted and that the mass was the expression of this corruption. And so the only way to be saved was to... Um, faithfully attend the old mass um and this led i mean growing up uh, um my wife only went to mass a couple times a month because mass was only available in the extraordinary form twice a month and from the pulpit she was told if, if you go to the ordinary form the novus ordo mass you will become a modernist um you'll probably become a homosexual i'm sorry <laughs> but you there was this there was this um sort of disposition of you will you will against your will um stop believing the true presence and adopt every modern heresy and so she didn't go to mass um and it wasn't until she got to college that she she experienced an entire community of catholics who had attended the novus ordo mass on a regular basis it went to daily mass and um were really really firm believers and faithful catholics and she recognized in them um, just the love of Christ and the joy of Christ, and it belied, it totally under, it undercut everything she had believed about um, the way you pray is the way you believe. Therefore, if you pray the new mass, you will, you will, you know, become a modernist. Because here was a whole group of people who were faithful traditional Catholics who attended this um, this mass. So, I mean, just to sort of begin, um, that's that's a, a temptation to, I mean, the radical part of radical traditionalism as an ism is that you adhere to it, the traditional Latin mass and pre-Vatican II Catholicism to the exclusion of and in suspicion of anything that came afterwards. That's what makes it radical. Um, as you said, Father Luke, we're all traditionalists to, to some extent, um, but this radical tradition. things that have been coming for me because like since we just started addressing this which by the way we only address because there are certain pockets that we're seeing of um faithful who are falling into a bit of confusion because of COVID 19 starting to go to the ssp x mass and like we said last week all right like um they're, they're reverent and they're selling and it well i'm not going to get into that and look i i understand i understand why they're going there but the problem now is the the narrative and stuff that they might be listening to in these circles is starting to pull them away from Vatican II. 
and it's basically everything before that and then the little seed of doubt is in the suspicions that starting to enter in there and they're starting to see everything post vatican ii as suspicious so bloom father joe um do you want to maybe go into there like the dangers of that approach to towards vatican ii like is could you just basically say that vatican ii like i've heard yeah 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 yeah, I kind of yeah, like, kind of like to pick, pick it, it, up, pick it up again where you, where you left off with Ave Maria because Ave Maria had an interesting posture on the issue, which I think is more the line, more, more the, 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 the true the traditional tr line, which was interesting. These liberal Catholics were like people who people like Joe Biden and you know practice contraception, you know, practice contraception and all those, and all sorts those of things. Sorts of obviously, things. Like, obviously, we're like, all against that. We're all against that. that. We're all against that kind of modernism. And so and at Ave Marie, so you, found, Marie, like, you found like these different kind of groups, kind of groups where, but where, we're all basically, but we're all basically, basically on the basically same page. On the same that, page you know, the church is church and it's it's the true church you know where it, what we did see is there is some people that started to um kind of were there in the past that was celebrated even in Ave Marie and went even farther farther right and you know i think that is uh a danger because it's a in the end it's, it seems to me to be like a um a lack of faith because it you know, if somebody, if somebody, you know, has certain issues with certain documents or certain things that happen in the new mass or, or whatever, you know, there's, we could talk about that. And you know, I think it's important to um, talk about all those things that people can kind of have trouble with. But uh, the underlying issue is if we're going to sit there and say that we believe in the church we believe that it's apostolic, that it's the true church, it's the same church that Jesus founded, then it doesn't make any sense to um, kind of make these accusations like James was talking about it. It's like this demonic, like, like literally Satan took over the church and, and started issuing all these, you know, evil documents with this evil mass. So if you're going to say, like, I believe in the church, the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, how can you go and start? evil kind of accusations against the church it doesn't make any sense it's it's a confusion in terms and um um yeah i think that's i think that's very important like i was going to say before i've heard it described as um well if it's like this big cake you know and you know that there's a bit of poison in it isn't it better just to throw the whole cake away and the argument that you know that everybody's just waiting for the church to correct herself and to change you know these 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 errors and i think it's just blinding us and we're missing like the big picture and i think that's one of the dangers it was just good to get that out there and you guys people listening throughout the whole thing we're obviously not saying that it's not okay to be you know in going to the extraordinary form and to be you know a lover of the latin mass they i think that was clear last episode and we're just gonna say that again we're just pinpointing dangers that the right has like ratzinger said only 10 years after the vatican uh, council too he comes out saying look it's so obvious to see the libs and to see what they're doing with the spirit of the council everybody sees it and it's obvious everybody's talking about it but there's another danger in there as well and that would be this ism this traditional ism movement that is also being born out of there and they're just putting a stop to it and they're saying that everything from here is not from god so like that little spirit also has to be talked about the spirit of you know whatever you want to call it um james you mentioned something in there that i wanted to touch on as well um somebody after we had done our one last week they sent me an article um Hildebrand wrote on reverence and the whole topic of reverence which they would always say that you know, it's very hard to get that spirit of reverence 
in the Novo Sordo. It's something that we've just kind of thrown out the window. Without reverence, there's no awe. Without awe, there's no really opening yourself up to who is God, who am I? And you're basically just going to mass for other reasons, and it's not going to happen. So would you think that there's a tendency from maybe this traditionalism or this hard right posture to kind of, which is, it's good to see God as other. Obviously, I'm not against that, you know, and when you go into the, the, the extraordinary form, there is a sense of otherness. Where am I and where is he? But do you think that there could be a tendency that he's so other, he's so not me, and he's so distant, that maybe it affects me and I my relationship with the God who who did become flesh and he did become one of us and he did lower himself, you know, to get into our lives where God can just be seen maybe as a sovereign king, uh, ruler, superior, and I'm here just to obey. And, you know, would you see a danger into like a spirituality with this, this emphasis, I'd say maybe too much emphasis on the otherness? I could be saying a heresy. What do you, I mean, what do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, it's such a good question because it seems to me that, um, stepping back from the debate within the church between the the traditionalism of um, pre-Vatican II Catholics and you might say the liberalism of unreflective post-conciliar Catholics or Vatican II Catholics who aren't um, reflective on the tradition, that the danger is always going to be an overemphasis. So you mentioned reverence. That is one of the, um, I mean, that's one of the main reasons why people our age, young people, are flocking to the Latin Mass is because um, this sort of desire for reverence, um, piety, you know, pietas. Uh, I, I only use the Latin there because it's something that's so important to remember is not, um, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit, right? It's the second gift of the Holy Spirit. It follows awe or um, fear of the Lord, right? Wonder. And this, this fear of the Lord that leads to piety and reverence as a gift of the Holy Spirit, it's a grace. And if you're saying that the that the mass lacks reverence, like the Novus Ordo lacks reverence, or that the traditional Latin mass is overemphasizes the otherness of God, right? Um, you're ignoring the role these gifts are supposed to have on um, on our disposition to God. I mean, to put it another way, the the danger of losing focus on God as not just your judge but your friend is is a danger that that's not it doesn't go away with the Nova sort of mass the danger is always going to be present um uh and i guess i guess what i'm trying to say is regardless of which mass you're looking at you're going to see there, there are going to be dangers attendant on on both masses um and i think you're right that the that if you if you're too attached to the uh, external pieties of the traditional Latin mass, the the beauty, the trappings, what uh, what our grandmother used to call the dog and pony show aspect of the liturgy, um, you you can lose sight of the fact that God in, is inviting you to profound friendship. He's not just your judge. He's not just the God man, but he's the man God too, um, who's inviting you into a relationship a lot more personal and intimate than um simply going to mass on the weekend would necessarily allow does that make sense oh i agree and just to i think that was a very good point you made that like it's it's wherever wherever you look at it there's always going to be these little cracks and dangers because at the end of the day it's like what are we the ones that are doing this you know is this is this like liturgy something that if we follow these norms and if we do everything right it's going to happen you know we're going to have it it's going to be an experience and i don't I love the I love the fact that you have the the five senses. You know that was also in the Hildebrand article that you know the the traditional mass appeals to your five senses more than Novus Ordo because we're human. We need that. You know the smell of incense, the hearing of the the liturgical music, the sight of everything. But like everything that we do, there's going to be a danger of you know us messing it up, and you could fall into a sentimentalism. You know because what if it just becomes like oh yes, they're all working, all my senses, and you just do it because you're feeling it and it's feeling great, and we know that life is not you know, about feelings. Everybody knows that. You know that you're married and you're still married. Um, you would be divorced right now if you had based your marriage on feelings. You know what I'm saying? So it's like anywhere you look at it, I think you're going down a rabbit hole that there's going to be problems because at the end of the day, I think we're trying to think that this is something, this is work of man, you know? 
when at the end of the day it's obviously the work of god you know re coming down for crying out loud to pull us up and to save us um i liked what you said in there um as well about the uh um yeah look it's a liturgical i don't look the whole thing is i don't want to get into like these liturgical politics either um, there's thousands of things out there if you guys want to get into these liturgical politics. I think Scott Hahn, again, um, guys, check out his. He's got a, I think it is called The Mass of the Ages. It's like this, um, I think it's the YouTube channel. I'm not sure, but it's an interview that they have with Scott Hahn, and he's basically nailing it left, right, and center. He's saying, look, guys, it's not about getting into these liturgical politics and fighting about, you know, like, you know, X, Y, and Z of like how things should be. He said, um, he said he stopped getting into that when one of a, a good priest friends of his said, uh, you know, the only liturgical abuse that I'm aware of, as far as I'm concerned, is what happens every time I receive communion. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a way of saying, like, what is going on here? You know, I have, and he's like, people are saying, like, how come there's not more people believing? You know, like when you think about our faith and, he's, and he says, like, we should be asking ourselves, how come anybody's believing, you know? Because maybe sometimes we get so caught up in all these like little rubrics or like formalities and we forget like who is really there, you know, who is, who is really there and like what's happening and, and if he's actually coming into me. So um, we're going to we did promise that we would uh, get these questions out there, too. So Father Bloomer and Brother uh, Brother James, <laughs> um, you guys can you guys can go for it. So I'm just going to read this first one here. This is from Kyle Myers. He says. Don't you think the priest turning his back to the tabernacle and distributing the communion in the hand undermines the sacredness of the Blessed Sacrament? Okay, so that's a um, a pretty basic one. Either one of you guys can go after that. So turn his back to the tabernacle and distributing communion in the hand. I don't know if you guys want to go for the communion in the hand or the... Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say that... Um, I have to say that um, it's... I mean, so much of it's interpreted. It, it, well, I would say it this way. Is it objective in the sense that um, think about kneeling and standing as gestures or prayer hands? I mean, we were, we were altar servers, right? And taught as altar servers to keep your hands like this, right, as a gesture. Is there something about this that is objectively, as in metaphysically out there, it, I mean, could never change that this is the most reverent hand posture there is, Right. Um, the answer is no, it's not, this is not an objective gesture. No gesture is objective. It's always going to be relational or what's called intersubjective in the sense that this comes from the Middle Ages, right? The way a, um, a, a, a man would swear his allegiance to a Lord, he would put his hands in this posture and the Lord would cover his hands, right? And it was a sign of, of um, fealty. So when the new mass... Um, was promulgated, of course, ad orientem, the facing the tabernacle wasn't changed. It was a, it was a gesture that the turning was permission that was gotten from, um, by bishops, by local ordinaries. And the idea was, was to emphasize with a different gesture, a different symbol, right? So the, the, the emphasis on gathering together at the wedding feast of the Lamb, inviting you to stop being a weekend warrior Catholic who shows up and does his time on Sunday, but but is, but is invited, given a seat at the table. So you might argue, well, the gesture is no longer efficacious or it's not nearly as efficacious or significant as the old gesture facing the tabernacle. That's fine. That's, that's something that you can argue. But this idea that it would be objectively dishonoring the Eucharist, as if it was, think about that. That would mean intentionally the priest or the bishops were saying, I want to slap God in the face, so I'm going to turn my back on him. Um, you know, or, I mean, because it's, and again, look at how it's negatively defined, turning your back on the tabernacle versus facing the people, um, or receiving on the hand. This is something that's come up a lot um, today. Um, and the idea that objectively, Christ condescending to be put in your hand is you, you know, scoring a point against him, slapping him, um, is to is to make gestures what they're not. It's to make them always mean the same thing. Um, whereas receiving on the hand, your skin, there's nothing about your tongue that's more sacred objectively than the palm of your hand. It has to do with, it's what it comes from within that'll defile you, not what goes in to you, right? So um, I just think it's, it's important to recognize that these gestures 
are conventional, they're matters of prudence, and they're matters of devotion. And that's as old as, as liturgy itself, that they have to be established in a community to be given meaning, and that um, they can never become, you know, hardened into these objective, you know, this is how you slap God, even if you're not meaning to slap God, you receive on the hand, you just slapped him, sorry, man, you're defiled, that kind of thing. I would uh, I would agree because you can apply that to a lot of things, a million things. And then we just become like neurotic almost. If it like I said, if it all really did depend on us, I would say um, with the the hand um, because it is you know like obviously you are you know you're getting very intimate there because you're you know you're on you're on the verge of this you know the mystical union. It's like the it's the climax point, you know, it's like the, the awaited moment, you know, it's like the union, you're going into like the, the bridal chamber, however you want to like say it, whatever. So like it, on a personal level for, um, and me speaking personally as well, like I'm a priest, so like it's not an issue as people, you know, other priests demanding that I receive in the hand. But I do understand where people are coming from on that point um, with the communion, just because of the sensitivity of that they have with you know, with our Lord. And I do think it's beautiful. And I think it's something that, you know, I would, I would encourage all faithful to, you know, to keep it up. That being said, um, I've, I have heard of, of people that because they won't be able to receive on the tongue, which I just said, I, I think I encourage you guys to always and always receive on the tongue when you can. Um, but because of these ridiculous times that we're living in, there have been priests, which against they're they're not allowed to, but they have been demanding that they receive on their hand. And there's people who have stopped going to mass because of it, and that's where I would I would pull this argument in that you just gave James um, for not to fight and not to say like you know you guys this is you know you're wrong and this is what you need to be listening to, but to give people peace of mind for crying out loud, peace of mind when it comes to receiving your Lord because like we said last week, it's the number one aim of the devil to keep you away from the Eucharist. It's that simple. He wants to keep you away from the Eucharist. How is he going to do it? In 10,000 ways, right? And he's going to always be thinking of better ways that you're never going to think up yourself. So if you not receiving on the tongue, because you, well, you can't receive on the tongue, you can only receive on the hand. If that's preventing you to go to Mass, um, receive on your hand. Receive on your hand. Why? Because you need to receive. You need to receive. You know, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no life in you. If you have no life in you, you are dead. And... That's what it's all about, you guys, is life in you, grace, in this life, so that you can be with him forever in the next. Um, so we've got another one here. Maybe you can take this one, um, Brother Father Bloomer. Um, this is Lucy Rovert. It, it is really unfortunate to listen to this. Okay, so this is going to be a juicy one. <laughs> um, firstly, okay, so the reason, let's see, go down it. The reason many, okay, the reason many, faithful Catholics have turned to the traditional Latin Mass is because we want to give God true worship. Additionally, we will answer to God for the souls of our children who are scandalized week in and week out by the sacrileges of the Novus Ordo. Far from the Novus Ordo being some sort of organic development, Pope Benedict XVI himself described it as a manufactured product. Quote, unquote. And we know now it was designed by a freemason with input from protestants respectfully fathers you both need to understand what is happening here the faithful will not no longer be gaslit as for the vatican council too in contrast to what father said the documents are both ambiguous and erroneous dignitatis humani teaches wrongly on religious liberty ut unum sint um don't think that's a vatican II document um Ut unum sint teaches ambiguously on ecumenism. Dei verbum teaches at best ambiguously on scriptural inerrancy. And there are other examples. We the faithful have had enough, enough of Pachamama idolatry, enough of globalism, enough of making the poor more important that the teaching of how to get to heaven. And yeah, that was a whole bunch there, a mouthful. I'm sorry, Father, I gave you that one. I don't know. Did you, uh, did you get all that? Did you want me to piece it out for you? Did you... Uh... Are you even there? Yeah, I mean that's kind I mean, of like that's what I was getting, like at, before, I was getting at before. You know? I think you know? it's I think that kind of that kind of um, attitude kind of wraps up in in one statement, kind of the spirit behind it. Because you know we got to look at the spirit of the person 
and the kind of, like I said, like the kind of spirit that they have. So, you know, not the, like I would agree with the traditionalist position on a lot of things. You know, I think most of us who are real Catholic, who believe in the church, we would, we would believe we would, we're, we, we're against, you know, communion in the hand. We're against like a lot of these things that, that happen, you know, but then you graduate these, some of these people graduate to this level where they start criticizing so much and criticizing and criticizing that they're the same faith that they profess so strongly seems to go against the very, the very, our very faith. Like they're, the faith that they profess no longer is the true faith of the church in the sense that it goes against what we say in the creed. I believe in one holy Catholic at apostolic church. And so from the beginning, you know, there was Jesus t chose 12 apostles and one was one was Judas, you know. And so we still see that today. You know, we still see that there's this element of the church, which is, you know, very much governed, very much Satan and trying to infiltrate in the church. And so it's, we shouldn't be surprised that, that these things happen. The problem is, is that we still have to maintain that the church is a divine institution. It was founded uh, by by our Lord, and all the councils and all the all the magisterial teaching is 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 part of our faith, including Vatican II. And so, although there might be a few things here and there which we could bring up for discussion, we have to stay within the church, you know, because if you once, like, there's as just as you can kind of like go outside the church on the left side, you can also go outside the church on the right side. And so this is what this is kind of like really the problem is the, you go into these groups, these traditionalist groups, and all they do is criticize like basically everything possible. You know, I've seen it again and again and again, and it's like you know, like I said, like you can talk about certain issues, and I and we're open to talking about certain issues like these she says dignitatis Iulani teaches wrongly on religious liberty like that's an interesting point and you could talk about that but the problem is is to say that as a whole this whole thing is evil and literally from the devil because if you say it's from the devil then how how do you believe in the church anymore you know that i think that's the real issue and, you know, the same goes for, like, all these, these uh, like, these newly canonized saints. We, we know that the Catholic Church has canonized a lot of these people, like Pope Juan, John Paul II, Pope Paul VI, John XXIII, you know, they're canonized saints. And so it, it brings a whole other issue, issue into it, whereas, like, well, if the Church is able, like, the only institution that's capable of canonizing people... Um, and you start, and you, you, and these people, like you know, they, they, they don't do anything but criticize Pope John Paul II. They don't, they, they make little effort to see the good that he did. And uh, you know, I think that's a real problem because you're can you're, you're, you're criticizing a canonized saint now. So, like, the question is, is he really a saint? And so then you, en you enter in the problem of, of like, like once again, you're, you're, you're shedding, shedding doubt on, on the, the uh, on the church being. A, a divine institution and that's where the, that's where the problem is like i said like i would i like to talk about a lot of different issues and the, the issues she brings up are, are really interesting and, and we can talk about those but this idea of the whole like, just shedding like uh uh obscurity and doubt on the whole entire thing is is a really dangerous really dangerous water i think no i yeah and it's I don't think it's, I mean, across the board, I know um, there are groups, maybe even that we're going to be listening, that, um, look, they're, they're where they're at, they're at in their clothes, and all of this is probably just going to be like, I don't know, like, we didn't start this to, um, you know, go at you guys with apologetics. Um, I'm thinking of a different group, which I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been fruitful and nice. And just to, the warn, the warning, um, don't make yourself a partisan. And uh, it was very easy to make yourself a partisan because we're like that. We're human beings. Um, last I checked, uh, we're, we're fallen, and we have a lot of tendencies. We got a lot of weaknesses, and we've got a lot of a lot of junk in there. And I think that's why um, he came down to save us. You know, I think that's what he's looking for: it, salvation to save us from all these 
miseries. So there's loads of it out there. Um, you brought up a point there too. Maybe I could throw this at you, James. Um, uh, it could be another danger. I could be wrong, but I think I'm also seeing um, because I don't know. There is a tendency to kind of close in. Um, you know, maybe this is us, and this is the way that we celebrate, and then like the rest, and maybe they're even in the wrong. Um, the other day, like we were just like I wasn't there, but like a friends of ours were telling they were praying the rosary, the grotto um, here in Ireland. They were within their their five kilometers, which you can only go five kilometers here. It's pretty bad. But uh, they were praying at one of the many grottos that are here in Ireland. And um, there was a family there that was praying the rosary as well. And they were praying it in Latin, which is nice. It's beautiful. All right. But um, they told me afterwards that, like, the family was just, you know, the there was the two daughters there and I think a son as well. They were all just looking at the ground, right? And um, when they went up to talk to him afterwards, you know, just a friendly conversation, like they weren't, they didn't look at them in the eyes, you know, and it was just like, they're just staring at the ground. Um, the mom was very kind of reluctant. Um, by the way, these were our sisters, you know, so it, does, it is important to say that they were religious sisters that, had, you know, experienced this. And our, our religious sisters are very bubbly and joyful and, and young and, and full of life. And the mom was a bit reluctant because she didn't know if their foundation was before or after Vatican II. So, like, before we can get into contact, we know we need to see, you know, where you're coming from. You know, they said that when we were founded, it was after Vatican II. And the mom was kind of surprised that, you know, like, she quoted, like, well, something good can come, you know, after Vatican II. But what I, what struck me, and it's funny because this was just a couple of days ago that they told me this, was, you know, this, this way of just kind of, like, closing in and, you know, just being, like, I don't know, like maybe it's just because you're so used to focusing on what has gone wrong or what is wrong that you don't think about anything else. I don't know. And it's, and it does affect you and it does affect your children. Would you see that as a, a danger as well, James, as like maybe just like a us against them or just closing off? And, and at the end of the day, like I'm just I, when I see Catholics, I think of evangelists like we're bringing the good news to other people. And I don't see that really. I don't know. It just in a regular setting. You know, we're going through high schools all day. I don't see that having an effect. I really don't. I, th I see it kind of just as like closed off. I don't know. Would that be a danger maybe as well? Yeah, no, I think it's a huge danger and it's danger I've experienced. Um, it's it's a danger I've experienced firsthand. Uh, and I think it develop, It comes from, as Father Bloom was saying, um, this, this habit of suspicion where everything that follows from Vatican II, everything sort of, is wrapped up in the heresy of modernism, it leads to a deep, deep fear, right? A fear for your children and a fear for yourself. And this fear, right, um, will is, is what drives you to um, the, the, the age old and very, very beautiful and clear um, rubrics of the traditional mass. And then also, you know, the rosary in Latin and all these other practices like the, like wearing the mantilla and such. Um, and, it, and I think it's the same danger as, as uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. Honestly, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but it's not holiness. And, it's, and it seems to me the difference needs to be made between being driven to say beauty um, out of fear and going out of love. And, it, and that's a, um, something I see the fear leads to polarization. So my father-in-law and I, we don't really talk anymore about <laughs> this stuff. Um, you know, we, we get along very, very, very well. But uh, for the most part, we don't have conversations about um, liturgy, especially and and the church. And a lot of it's because he's sort of he's seen the world and the, and the and the sort of corruption within the church. And I mean, he comes from a very remote part of Montana where there was there was a lot of liturgical abuse. And he sort of retreated. And his and his his attitude is, you know, it it's all too confusing. I know it's safe. What's safe is to just sort of retreat into these. Um, old forms, and what I've seen um, as a as the fruit of that fear is, he it's like he can only see God as his as his judge, and um, his savior and his king, all very true and and worth reminding ourselves of. But when I asked him, you know, and don't you know Christ is your lover, right? This is this is the language of the mystics. This is this should shock you, but it's it's the language of the early church fathers and it's the language of the, of the mystics. Um, that Christ wants to be your friend and your lover, there was a there was sort of a no 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 I'm not I'm not worthy I'm and 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 he sort of retreated back into this um, that sounds also newfangled I need to be 
just sort of march with my head down, you know, go to mass, do these uh, forms. And, and it's a sort of renunciation of um, that sort of liveliness that you're called to. Um, not my father-in-law, by the way, this is not a judgment on, on his faith. It's just something I've noticed in his uh, conversation about liturgy. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a huge danger to, to see these forms as, as spells and God is a kind of vending machine. I mean, you can slip into that, that if I cast the right spells, if I dance the right way, um, or if I do X, Y, and Z, God will give me A, B, and C. Um, but God isn't a vending machine, and, and these beautiful traditions of the church aren't spells, and if you're not careful, you can slip into a sort of habit, a complacent habit of treating them as the substance of your faith rather than the expression of it. Um, I think you just nailed it providentially that at the end of the day um it's like the condensation of like god going down to that level and at the end of the day to tell us that he's madly in love with us you know by the way i want to spouse you you know i want to i want this divine intimacy you know this this communication like which would in biblical language would mean like they would be talking about like sexual intercourse you know like that word of god communicated him they would have understood god wants union with us very close is it scandaling yeah it's scandalizing yes it scandalized uh, a lot of people you know a lot of people and it's still to this day does but i think at the end of the day that is the heart of everything um this crazy god that we have he's madly in love with us he's so madly in love with us and he'll jump anything He'll do anything to get to us. And um, I'm not saying that that means we jump the rules and we just, you know, everybody holds hands and it's all hunky-dory. Um, and in, in no way do I want to say that I'm just blindsiding, like, you know, the abuses that have happened and what does happen, you know, unfortunately, Nova Sordo. I, I hope that's clear. But at this one, I just wanted to, Brother Boomer, Father Boomer said it well, you can leave from both sides, the left and the right. And just like what we're concentrating on now, because we all know, guys, we all know what's going on, on the left. We don't have to talk about it here. You've all experienced it firsthand. You have. But we're just reaching out pastorally to those who, you know, maybe will become enclosed. I don't want to see you guys enclosed on the right. That's what the whole point of this is. Don't want to see you slowly, slowly drift off and enclose yourself on the right. Um, Scott Hahn, like I said, is a great example. Uh, the reading we had two days ago in the Apocalypse as well, you know, I think it was the Church of Ephesus. I recognize your good works. I see how hard you guys are fighting against the heretics. You're doing an amazing job defending the truth. But I have one thing against you. You have forgotten your first love. You've forgotten that time when I first met you, when you first heard my voice, who I was for you, and then realizing who you are for me. That whole, you know, that whole communication you've forgotten that and you've become so and so stuck on fighting the heretics what's wrong this is right and that's what i have against you come back to your first love that you guys he's talking to the church of ephesus you know we're not that far from our lord you know or saint john you know our blessed mother could have been in that congregation imagine that and even that in that circumstance he has that complaint against them you've drifted off from your first love so i think i think that's it i think you nailed it there at the end of the day you guys um that's what it is really about it really is you know the holy spirit communicating in our hearts that's what prayer is it's not something that you're doing i'm sorry if you think you're professional prayer you need to start over again because prayer is something that he does in us he does it sometimes through groaning sometimes through a language which we don't understand but that's what he's doing through us and um it's it's the work of god the liturgy it's the work of god and we are the humble servants there so let's do our best you know to give our best to him without becoming enclosed without you know shutting ourselves up and um we can end it also with scott Hahn, what he said you know like it's the catholic faith you guys it's not about choosing a and rejecting b or c and rejecting b and a it's about going for d all the above you know the catholics are not out out either or you know, either this or this. We are and, and, et, et, this and this. So don't close yourself off. That is the Catholic spirit. And uh, we've got a whole world to evangelize for crying out loud, guys. We have to open up. We have to break out. Because there's people who don't know that God has become so small. There are people that don't know that you can receive this God so big and a host that's so small and he can go into your heart. They just don't know about that. 
you do. And it's your responsibility that they do because you've received the sacraments, you're confirmed. You're supposed to be going out there and telling the people who don't know this good news that you've received. Don't be fooled by the devil in closing yourself in on your little world and your little rubrics and what you think are the big problems. There's bigger problems out there, guys. Salvation of souls. So um, thank you so much, lads, uh, for all this. Thank you for Dearmit as well, for Robert and Alan. You guys, those little little donations for the cause, it's it's helping out just so that we can keep this this apostolate on. And um, yeah, we'll see each other next week. I thank you so much, Father Bloomer, if you're still out there. I know you're you froze there, but I think we understand because you are in a third world country. So, you know, pray for Brother Father Bloomer. He's he's at he's really he's behind the cannon there. And uh, James as well. Thank you for taking time out. Say hi to kids and. Um, uh, praying for you guys a lot and all of you guys who are out there listening um you know in a spirit in a spirit of prayer we can end it now with the glory be and um we'll see you guys next week in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen glory be to the father to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and never shall be world without end amen the lord be with you with your spirit may almighty god bless you the father the son and the holy spirit amen Thanks, guys. We'll see each other next week.